Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Yuri Lewicki, and tonight we're going to be discussing the shoulder, injury to treatment through modern advances. I'd like to thank Carrie Butler and the Hopco team for putting these together. Obviously, times have been trying as far as patient contact, and this seems like a great way to outreach and educate at the same time. I am a board-certified orthopedic surgeon, and I have an additional board certification in orthopedic sports medicine. I was fellowship trained in sports medicine and surgery of the shoulder and knee, and I have clinic locations both in Flagstaff and Prescott Valley. Likewise, I perform surgery in both of those venues as well. So a little bit about me, because I feel that that's important uh, as we go forward here, uh, is my journey. I am a Flagstaff native, mostly. Uh, my parents arrived with my brother and I in 1974, and we grew up uh, loving the outdoors, uh, which precipitated my desire to be in the outdoors as much as possible and, and be an athlete. Um, I have a true affinity for all things water, whether that be water skiing, wake surfing, uh, surfing, swimming, uh, anything. I like that. Snow skiing as well. Uh, it is quite ironic, though, when you think about Arizona uh, and the lack of water that we have. Um, I did my undergraduate uh, degree. It was a double degree at the Northern Arizona University. And uh, once again, I, my love of nature and natural surroundings uh, was transcended into a, an additional passion for the healing of the human body. I after completing my education at Northern Arizona, I chose to go to medical school down in Tucson. This was a decision based on a couple factors. One, my love of the Southwest, but also uh, the weather. When you're talking about going into intensive training, uh, it certainly is nice when you have a day off to be able to do something outdoors and not have to depend on uh, bad weather ruining your plans. So Tucson was a great choice. There, uh, I undertook the Hippocratic Oath, which uh, right now has come under fire in some venues, unfortunately, but I still believe in one of the concepts of it uh, that I do hold to heart is first, do no harm. Uh, I think that's certainly important. Uh, after completing my um, medical school education there, I chose to continue in residency at the University of Arizona, uh, where I was exposed to two huge sports medicine uh, giants, one Dr. Bill Grana, the other Dr. Rob Hunter, and they were integral in cultivating and uh, preparing me for fellowship and beyond. Uh, my fellowship was at the San Diego Sports Medicine and Arthroscopy Fellowship of Shoulder and Knee uh, with Dr. James Tasto. It was a comprehensive fellowship year in which I was under the tutelage of 11 surgeons, we trained at 14 different venues and essentially did over 500 cases in a year. And once again, that was extremely useful in cultivating uh, who I became. I definitely want to mention that when it comes to the shoulder, it is not in its infancy anymore, but certainly has come quite a ways in just the past 20 years, and that is due to the Mavericks that were before me and my ability to do what I do at the level that I do is so dependent upon what they went through and what they struggled with. If you look in this particular slide, this is an old arthroscope in which they would place that into the patient and then look through this apparatus directly, hunched over. The Instruments that we utilize today include the image above, in which it's a handheld device with 4D capabilities, uh, truly remarkable. Uh, but I would like to note that respect for those mentors and mavericks truly is warranted. They taught me that others' misfortunes are lessons to be learned from, and that this translated into advancement and triumph. Some of these shoulder mavericks that I had direct exposure to were Dr. James Esch, and through uh, fellowship and then directly as well through meetings and uh, journal reviews was Dr. Steve Snyder and uh, Steve Burkhart. 
and these guys collectively has been, have been known as the three amigos for shoulder uh, arthroscopy, and they were the shoulder forefathers, really, uh, in cultivating and producing the technology that we have today. After fellowship, I elected to come back home to Flagstaff, and I joined Northern Arizona Orthopedics in the Sports Medicine Division. I've now been here for 14 years, and I am a shoulder and knee sports medicine specialist. Uh, some of the additional things that I do outside of clinic are I am the orthopedic team physician for Northern Arizona University Athletics. I am a clinical preceptor for the Department of Physical Therapy and Athletic Training at Northern Arizona University as well. I cover athletic high school teams as well. Certainly the journey uh, that continues requires additional education and I am an active member in the Arthroscopy Association of North America as well as the American Orthopedic Society of Sports Medicine. This requires continuing medical education, labs, meetings, journals, things that produce uh, cutting edge information that keep me up to date and allow me to strive uh, to the next level. Um, Certainly uh, a few mantras that I hold dear are, I don't simply take care of patients, I care for patients. Uh, that is very important to me. And another mentor of mine once told me, choose what you want to do and then be passionate about it. Strive and settle for nothing less than being the best at it. And that's the scenario for success. And I believe that wholeheartedly. Another maverick that I cannot pass by is the one that I grew up with. My father, Dr. Roman T. Lewicki, he was a shoulder and knee sports medicine specialist as well. He has since retired and now enjoys his horse. But through his dedication and determination uh, and overall assistance, he shaped the framework for who I've become as well. The journey certainly can't be uh, complete without mentioning my loving family. Uh, my two sons and my loving wife who have been there through the trials and tribulations of whether it be residency and uh, the extraordinary hours and dedication that this profession requires and to simply keeping me real and knowing that life is out there, they are out there and they need to be paid attention to as does work-life balance. They are a skiing family with me and thankful for that. I am. Uh, we now have three generations of skiers. So this is who I am. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I've been doing this now for 20 years, 14 years in private practice. And I see my role as an expert in shoulder and sports medicine health. Some may say that a surgeon is essentially someone who holds a scalpel. Others say that surgeons cut first and ask questions later, but I am, in my opinion, the furthest from that. I truly believe that you have to look at the entire spectrum that a person brings to you at a clinic visit. It's a holistic approach. Certainly surgery is important, and when in indicated, I bring to it my surgical expertise. But in order to get there, that journey requires proper physical exam, proper history taking, proper interpretation of studies, and again, an overall assessment of the patient. So, here's the, my soapbox. Water. Hopefully everybody had a little bit of that happen today. We were blessed with a little bit of a monsoon. But when it comes to the human body and the shoulder, water is something that cannot be forgotten. It is important in every process of the human body and every function. From simply saliva and aiding in digestion, from assisting it as a shock absorber for joints, for conversion of food, for transport of important proteins, for healing. Water is in the majority of compartments. It's incredible. 70% of your brain is water. 80% of muscle, 90% of the plasma or liquid portion of your blood uh, is water. And believe it or not, even 30% of your bone is water. So what it comes down to is drink water, hydrate, 
Not only does your body health depend upon it, so does your shoulder. So what are we going to do tonight? Well, we're going to have a little discussion about the patient encounter. I've already touched on that, the importance of a holistic approach to that. Communication and connection, how do you achieve that? Physical exam, how is that important in the shoulder? What are the maneuvers or some of them? And what studies are available to us since we have now become more and more comfortable with learning more about the shoulder and what there is and what it's made up of? Certainly we'll get to the shoulder basics, anatomy and function. We'll talk about injury and treatment of various disorders, primarily focusing on rotator cuff tears, instability and arthritis, though I will briefly touch on some others. Certainly you, you could spend hours going over an entire textbook about shoulder disorders, but these are the main ones that we'll touch on and I invite your questions for other ones and would be happy to get back to you about those. We'll then move to cutting edge treatments stuff that I take pride in as, as well uh, as I had told you, staying up to date. Progression has really advanced over these last 20 years to the benefit of patients. We're not avoiding doing things because we don't know about them anymore. We're actually doing things because we know more about them. And then what about future directions? So why a shoulder specialist? Well, I'm sure as many of you have gotten on to this Zoom meeting, you're probably pretty facile in using a smartphone, maybe some are not, or the internet, but you can go and Google anything, and the shoulder is no different. You can find 10 causes of shoulder pain and do a self-diagnosis. And though the Google diagnosis may not actually be the best way to treat yourself, it sure, certainly prepares you and allows you to understand the language perhaps a little bit better. So it shouldn't substitute for an expert, but I think it can complement in many ways. If nothing else, I can be somebody that helps you basically look through the weeds and decipher what is what. So the patient encounter. One thing I also pride myself on is my patients are teachers. I am a musculoskeletal health teacher and provider. That is my expertise but patients bring with them unique circumstances, unique physical exam findings, unique injuries, illnesses. They teach me. My curiosity continues because of that. We're frozen, there we go. So what about the art of history taking? Certainly we wanna know about someone's age, hand dominance when it comes to the shoulder. What is your occupation? What kind of sports and activities do you participate in? Have you involved, been involved in a trauma? When did this occur and where? What's the character of pain? Does it radiate? What are the aggravating factors? Is it getting better or worse? And night pain, very simply one of the most important symptoms, night pain. What's the effect on your daily life? Is there grinding? Do you have weakness? Do you have numbness? And of course, pain. So as we touched earlier, the holistic component not only is this evaluating the physical findings someone brings to me, but it's also their emotional, spiritual as well. We live in a society where there's many different spiritualities and it does have effects on types of implants that you can use. It has the effect on types of treatments one will be okay with. And obviously intellectual, all of these cannot be underestimated. They are important in the overall treatment. So communication and connection, certainly we're all getting more used to this, but it is a conundrum. How do you connect with someone that's wearing a mask? The eyes certainly can help, but facial expression in the clinic visit certainly does allow for a lot of help in deciphering what's going on with someone. Here at Northern Arizona Orthopedics, we are following social distancing. We're following the use of masks, hand washing, proper symptom awareness and we want you all to be aware that when you come here we're making this as safe as we possibly can and we will get through this and my hope is we won't have the masks because I do enjoy seeing people's faces. So physical examination, inspection, again observation super important. There's so much to be learned just by walking in somebody's room and talking to them. 
That was a big frustration when we were doing telemedicine and just talking to a camera. Certainly patients could respond and we could see them, but it's not the same. And having people back in our clinics definitely is where we want to be. Palpation of body parts, super important. What about range of motion? We certainly want to know and compare operative, pardon me, op opposite extremities. We want to see what's normal, what's not normal for somebody. We strength test, we test stability and sensation, and then there are, of course, special maneuvers and special tests that help to formulate what we're up against. What about studies? Well, there's many different types of advanced studies now. There are the traditional x-rays, which are these here. And when you come to the clinic, we certainly get x-rays performed and we evaluate them. We also have CT scans, which is a high-powered radiographic study that allows us then to place them into a three-dimensional uh, three dimensional picture, which then we can critique and assess. Certainly, people have heard also most likely of magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, and that is very helpful with evaluation of the soft tissues. These studies are very helpful with for bone architecture. Soft tissue analysis is more in the realm of MRI. So, sit back and let me show you a little bit about my world, the shoulder. It's a complex structure, and for that, it is a shoulder complex by definition. There are four articulations. There's a glenohumeral articulation, which is the shoulder proper. That's what most people think of when they think of shoulder motion. Then there is the acromioclavicular joint and motion that does occur there and injury frequently. Additionally, not in this particular radiographic image, but there is a sternoclavicular joint as well that also has motion. The shoulder really is free floating except for its muscular connection, muscular tendinous connection to the thorax. Therefore, the final articulation is a scapulothoracic articulation. There is minimal bony constraint when we're talking about shoulder and stability and how the shoulder is stabilized really is dependent upon dynamic and static stabilizers. So, of note, the shoulder complex composed of 30 muscle tendon units and it, their attachments. The scapula itself has 17 of those. There are three bones that we will discuss, the scapula, the clavicle, and the humerus. In addition, there are bursal spaces, and bursal spaces are soft tissue, fluid-filled sacs that basically are placed between areas that are gonna see wear and tear, between a bone rubbing on a tendon or bones on bones, but they are very important in maintenance of shoulder health. I'm frozen there, there we go. So here we are looking at the shoulder anatomy and as you can see this is the arm bone or humerus. Then we have the scapula and then the collarbone is known as the clavicle and then the roof of the shoulder which is a portion of the scapula is known as the acromion. All of these play a pivotal role in normal health as well as disease processes. When we look on this particular image you can see the soft tissue stabilizing uh, structures of the shoulder that include a capsule as well as a soft tissue cartilage region called the labrum and then the biceps tendon which also is coming in and connecting into the inner portion of the shoulder. The rotator cuff muscles are a dynamic stabilizer of the shoulder meaning they change. There are four primary rotator cuff tendon muscle units. There is one in the front known as the subscapularis. There's one on the top known as the supraspinatus. And then there are two in the back known as the infraspinatus and teres minor. As you can imagine the ones in the back help with external rotation of the shoulder and an outward motion. The one in the front helps with internal rotation and the one on top ha helps with bringing the arm up above. So what about function of these rotator cuff tendon muscle units? Well they certainly are dynamic stabilizers. They are a depressor of the humeral head, keeping it locked into the glenoid itself or the uh, socket so then that the larger muscle groups can move the shoulder in space. Glenohumeral instability is primarily dependent on these soft tissue structures, both static and dynamic. 
Again, the static ones are the bony architecture, of which some liken the shoulder to a golf ball sitting on a tee. And in very many ways, this is similar. If the tee becomes damaged, in other words, the bony architecture, the ball has a more tendon or has a propensity to fall off of this. What about the joint capsule? That is a static, also uh, static restraint that holds the ball in place. Um, there's also a negative intracapsular pressure, which is about a millimeter of synovial fluid that sits and causes compression here. Dynamic stabilizers are, as I mentioned, the rotator cuff tendons, which cause not only concavity compression, which holds it in place, but also stabilize it via the force of the muscle units. Shoulder function, of course, we talk about forward elevation and extension. We talk about rotation and then abduction going upwards and adduction or adding it to the body. So why do we treat the shoulder? Well, because we want to sleep like this. There are so many of my patients that come in and say, Doc, I'm not sleeping. And it's usually dependent on the shoulder having pathology. The goal is to get people to sleep again. And how important is that? So a body that's out of balance, it's going to create unevil, uneven wear. Health does equal alignment. So my job is to realign, to provide a foundation for balance. I do that via conservative measures. I do that via surgical measures. I do that via holistic approach. Again, assessing all components of one's health. How do I do that further? Well, it's a partnership. My patients, I see them as a team member. I can't do this alone. It takes you as well to be a participant. That's how we achieve success in our recoveries. Shoulder injury and treatment can be divided very basically into articular causes and then periarticular causes. Obviously, articular meaning joint involves the joints that we talked about before. They can also involve the ligaments within the joint as well as instability of those joints. They can also involve fractures directly in the joint. When we talk about periarticular or around the joint, we can talk about bursal tissue or bursitis. We can talk about tendonitis, which is the itis, meaning inflammation, is inflammation of tendon or inflammation of bursa. Rotator cuff, again, is periarticular, as is the biceps. So guiding principles when we talk about injury to treatment, very basic and pretty straightforward. Joints prefer to be reduced. Bones want to be aligned. Muscles like to be intact, as do tendons. And the main objective is try to recreate normal anatomy when it comes to injury and recovery. Patients frequently present with pain that radiates. And they try and diagnose based on that, saying, well, my pain is here or there, and it must mean this or that. Well, there have been many studies, numerous people come out and said, well, this pain here means that it's a sternocolicular joint, and this pain up here means a supraspinatus joint, and et cetera. I ask you to focus in on this picture here and realize there are so many nerves around the shoulder, and all these nerves communicate via electric current and signal. When one nerve becomes involved, its friends become involved, and radiation patterns of pain can happen just about anywhere. The shoulder translates to the neck, the shoulder translates down to the hand, vice versa. It's all real, so it's not black and white. Radiation patterns are good to know, but they don't dictate what exactly is wrong. So non-arthritic shoulder pain, what are we going to cover? Well, we're going to focus a little bit about rotator cuff pathology and shoulder instability. Impingement relates directly to rotator cuff pathology because we're talking about pinching of those rotator cuff tendons. Frozen shoulder, which Again, if people have questions, I'm happy to answer about all of these entities. Frozen shoulder is more of a restrictive movement disorder involving the capsule of the shoulder. Instability patterns, we talk about shoulder joint separation. There's also biceps pathology, a frequently forgotten and ignored entity, unfortunately, but that is now becoming less so. Uh, instability patterns when we talk about labral tearing especially common in shoulder dislocation. 
And then of course, trauma and fractures to the shoulder and its complex as well. We'll also cover arthritic shoulder pain. And as you can see, there are numerous different types of arthritis. There's causes of arthritis. Uh, but we will focus again on these pr with presenting symptoms and exam findings and treatments for these. So, rotator cuff pathology, what is it? Well, those rotator cuff tendons, muscle tendon units, can become damaged. The tendon can tear, the tendon can become uh, contused, you can have nerves that aren't functioning to the muscle. All of these things are possibilities. What mechanism can these occur with? Well, trauma, certainly. Degenerative change, overuse, things just breaking down, unfortunately. What are the common symptoms for all these entities? Well, pain, not being able to sleep, another frequent one. Weakness, especially associated with rotator cuff tears. Loss of motion also. And for the worst case scenario, usually drop arm sign, where someone can just not even move their arm. So what about treatment for these? Advancements, again, due to the Mavericks, created more ability to utilize shoulder arthroscopy, small instruments that can go directly into the joint via small incisions measuring less than a centimeter in size, in which basically we build a ship in a bottle. And the visualization that we see on a screen is tremendous. We're able to take the rotator cuff tendon that might be torn and reattach it where it's supposed to be via anchors that are either metal or plastic or bioabsorbable. Surgery can either be arthroscopic or it can also be open procedure. An open procedure at this juncture in history is becoming less common, but one has to be versed in it because there are times where it becomes necessary. In my opinion, arthroscopic surgery affords better visualization, easier recovery, and less pain. So here's some arthroscopic images where one can see inside of the joint where normally there should be a veil of tissue. Again, the rotator cuff tendons covering this area. By going in with a scope and placing anchors appropriately that have suture attached to them, I'm able to place an array of sutures across this tendon and bring it back to where its native position is supposed to be, ending up with a repair such as this. Now, no tear is seen. When we discuss glenohumeral instability, another common entity involved with shoulder pathology, we're talking about loss of either dynamic or static structures or both. And it can dislocate the shoulder, any of the four articulations, in multiple directions. It can also occur from traumatic injury or chronic structural abnormalities. Additionally, developmental abnormalities can lead to this. Symptoms frequently are instability, a feeling or sensation that they cannot one cannot depend on their shoulder. The possibility that motion is lost, especially when the shoulder itself is dislocated. What is the treatment? Again, there are both open and arthroscopic procedures. Arthroscopic procedures utilize small instrumentation, small anchors, as well as suture, and the idea is to recreate the normal anatomy, whether that be bringing bone fragments back to a normal position, or soft tissue areas, bringing those back to a normal position as well. The image on the lower right shows what's called the lateral decubitus position, a position that I utilize in shoulder arthroscopy. And essentially, it is with the patient on their side with uh, the scope entering from the back portion of the uh, patient, which then affords ample room and access to the remainder of the other structures of the shoulder. In these arthroscopic images, and actually the image on the left is a CT scan, you're able to see where the arrow points that there is a bone fragment missing, not necessarily missing, but is displaced. And this is known as a bankart, bony bankart tear, common again in uh, contact athletic sports. The image in the middle is the arthroscopic image showing the bone fragment on the right and the socket on the left, the articular cartilage socket. And then through arthroscopic instrumentation and placement of anchors, once again, I'm able to position that bone fragment in its normal anatomic alignment 
and then tie these sutures and hold it in place and allow the body to heal. So surgical precision definitely requires detail recognition. How about shoulder arthritis? So arthritis, arthro means joint, itis means inflammation. It's a degenerative disease. It leads to progressive joint breakdown. It's the third most common joint to suffer arthritis. The first two being knee and hip. And the mechanism can be multifactorial. In fact, my colleague Cody Martin just made it available to me that there's over 100 types. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't aware of that. That's pretty impressive. So a normal joint consists of cartilage, a soft tissue cushion that, again, is mostly composed of water. And the joint lining, synovium, which secretes of lubricant fluid, mostly containing water. Hydrate, it's everything. Normal joint health depends on it. And when the breakdown of these cartilage surfaces or the synovium or lining of the joint occurs, arthritic changes are what develop. First with softening of cartilage, next with what we call fibrillation or small fissures, and then actual damage to the cartilage until it gets to the point where it's down to bare bone. What are the symptoms of arthritis? Again, all shoulder pathology involves pain. Weakness can be a component. Loss of motion is more common in shoulder arthritis by far. And this is because of the bony prominences or loss of the normal shoulder architecture. There's, to name a few, primary arthritis or osteoarthritis, which is wear and tear arthritis. And this is where you see bone on bone changes. There's also rheumatoid arthritis and other type of inflammatory arthritis where you actually can involve multiple joints and see joint erosions. There's also arthritis that develops because of the bone itself dying. We call this avascular necrosis and it can occur for multiple reasons, but common risk factors include steroid use in the form of corticosteroids, alcohol, and certain blood disorders. Additionally, when the rotator cuff tendon is not functioning properly, the shoulder sees abnormal motions, and those more motions translate into cartilage abnormality and degradation and degeneration. Post-traumatic certainly has consequences on the joints as well, and when dealing with fractures, again, we try to recreate normal anatomy because once an injury has occurred, the shoulder is different. Treatment, well, there certainly is conservative treatment for all of these types of situations, and sometimes that is the best choice. That can involve physical therapy, activity modification, injections, of which there's different types. And then something that I will touch on in the cutting edge and future is orthobiologics or regenerative medicine. That is now kind of the cutting word, cutting edge word that many people are looking towards and hoping that it is the fountain of youth. There is arthroscopic choices for both, or pardon me, for um, arthritic changes. They are both arthroscopic possibilities as well as joint replacement or arthroplasty. Arthroscopic means involve uh, a comprehensive uh, joint cleaning in essence with removal of fragments and loose bodies where joint arthroplasty involves replacement of the joint itself. So frequently in the clinic setting patients come to me and there are certainly numerous questions that are asked and one of the key things is to filter through what exactly do, does the patient need and how do they decide what they need. Questions that arise are, are they a good candidate? What about insurance? What kind of outcome? What can I expect from this? What's the, um, the risk factors, the complications? What about pain afterwards? How will that be managed? What's the recovery period? What kind of help will I need after this? And can I return to my exercise, my daily activities? Maximizing outcome definitely potentiates success. And that can be done with a few simple items. One, a commitment to rehabilitation. I can't stress how important physical therapy is. Another mentor of mine taught me that surgical foundation provides you 10% of the recovery. Certainly, if you don't have a good foundation, the rest is not going to be as good. 
So I cannot underestimate the importance of that. But as I talked about, the team environment, the participation of you, the patient, that is the 90%, as well as the physical therapist, as well as family members. Everybody becomes a team player in this. What other success factors? Well, obviously age and activity level and overall health. What you bring to surgery, if you're more healthy or more active, it's easier to recover. Sometimes we do physical therapy before surgery to try and maximize that and condition muscles. Certainly, success factors are dependent on things that may not be in our control, such as the type and severity of arthritis and the condition and quality of your bone. Within my surgical quiver for joint replacement surgery, again, things have really come along in the last 20 years, even in the last three or four years. And now what we have at our disposal are bone preserving shoulder replacement surgery. We have short stem replacement surgery in order that we use or remove less bone in anticipation that younger patients, as they are more active these days and more injuries are occurring, that the total shoulder replacements will be occurring in a younger population. We need to preserve bone longer so that if future revision scenarios are necessary, we'll have bone to work with. There are reverse shoulder replacements, whereas in the past, patients that had severe rotator cuff tears and arthritis or just tears that were irreparable, usually they would have to just live with that situation. Now we have an answer for that. Again, this is geared more towards the older population, but we're starting to push the envelope in these with other devices. Certainly when it comes to fractures, sometimes you have to simply replace the shoulder, and there now are fracture stem replacements as well. So what is the difference between a total shoulder, conventional, versus a reverse total shoulder? In this particular side, you, slide, you can see the total shoulder arthroplasty, and it consists of making the anatomy near normal. We place, replace the humeral head with metal, and we place a stem or a stemless component. We use the socket portion uh, in its normal anatomy as well, and we place what's called a poly, polyethylene liner. This is plastic. <coughs> Fixation of these devices is done either by a fresh, pardon me, press fit with porous coating or cemented in place. A reverse total shoulder, ironically, is exactly the reverse. We take the ball and we make that a socket with a stem. And we take the socket and we turn it into a ball, otherwise known as a glenosphere. It does change the normal architecture of the shoulder. And again, it is implanted with either a press fit component or cement, and the socket component or glenosphere is placed with screws. Again, I cannot over underestimate or overemphasize the importance of balance in surgery, balance in health, balance in athleticism. So, cutting edge. What are some things that have just developed on the horizon of recent? Well, as I mentioned in the past, people that did not have a rotator cuff because it was either torn decades ago or destroyed now have an option for reconstruction of their tendon with something called a superior capsular reconstruction. This is a dermal allograft. It's a cadaver graft that you can place into the patient's shoulder and actually recreate a tendon. We're essentially recreating the capsule of the joint itself, but you can attach portions of the tendon. And there have been actual studies that show that muscle atrophy, or when a muscle is not on tension because it's torn, it tends to get smaller. With this newer technique and attaching muscles to this, you actually can start to see the muscle regenerate and become strong. Certainly, you will not get back to the absolute normal state, but it is exciting to see that. What about tear pattern recognition? I can't, again, stress the importance of this in arthroscopic surgery. Arthroscopic surgery is not cookbook medicine. A rotator cuff tear on Mr. So-and-so is not the same on Mrs. So-and-so. Each one is different. Each one needs to be addressed individually. And each pattern has a unique pattern that needs to be reproduced. Remember, the common goal. What are we trying to do? Recreate normal anatomy.
Other cutting edge important items, rehabilitation. Physical therapy has come so far and our understanding about it and it, uh, my partners uh, in surgical recovery are my physical therapists <clears throat> and I can't emphasize enough their importance. What about the bank heart, the bony bank heart? That is instability of the shoulder and now we have seen a new push for also addressing both sides of the injury, not only where the shoulder exits in one side, but also the damage it causes on the other. And a realm passage technique is where we actually place one of the rotator cuff tendons into a defect that's created from a dislocation event. Cutting edge, shoulder arthroplasty, amazing blueprint templating for shoulder arthroplasty. This is a CT, a 3T, pardon me, 3D CT of the patient's actual shoulder that I am able to place onto a computer program and then implant the implants and actually see range of motion, see where the implant might impinge and maximize overall guidance intraoperatively on what I want to use and how I want to place it. Additionally, cutting edge is lateralizing the reverse at first, it was all about bringing the center of rotation in a medial word direction, but now we're trying to recreate more of a normal anatomy, trying to get more motion and more stability for these individuals, and by lateralizing, we're achieving that. <coughs> Again, cutting edge with the total shoulder arthroplasty on the left, reverse total shoulder arthroplasty on the right, and 3D CT surgical planning prior to surgery. What about the future? Well, the future is here. Uh, they now have nanoscopes, and these scopes are getting smaller and smaller. It literally is almost becoming uh, like needle surgery, and that probably is the, the future at some point where you're operating almost through the size of just a, a large needle. Um, additionally, what about computer planning? Well, some individuals now are taking this directly into the OR. It's called mixed reality visualization, and they wear these goggles and you're actually able to see a 3D image, if you want to, that you created via their, the patient's own 3D anatomy and see how does it look while you're in the OR. Again, quite exciting. The future is here. What about orthobiologics, regenerative medicine? Certainly a hot topic right now. Certainly many individuals, whether they be healthcare practitioners or not even healthcare practitioners partaking in utilizing this. The three that I'll focus on are what are known as platelet rich plasma, bone marrow aspirate stem cell, and just stem cell therapy. And the question is, is this snake oil or is it the fountain of youth? And I think the answer is it's not known. Certainly, platelet rich plasma has its indications, and we actually do provide this at Northern Arizona Orthopedics, as we do also bone marrow aspirate stem cell therapy the patient is selected and we discuss the situation with them. We make sure that they are a good candidate and we also make sure that they follow the appropriate rules for administration and use. Um, the future holds that these will be better defined and refined uh, so more conditions can be treated appropriately. Right now we're kind of throwing the kitchen sink at a lot of things, hoping that the elements that are important for that particular disease will be utilized. Ideally, what it comes down to is we're all trying to focus on heading towards how do we harness the body's innate healing capacity. And this arthroscopic image, which was on the cover of Arthroscopy uh, magazine or journal years ago, shows neovascularization, which are small new blood vessels in the rotator cuff footprint where normally a tendon is supposed to sit. And when there wasn't tendon present, this is what was occurring. The vessels were reaching out, almost searching for something to adhere. Quite amazing, the body's innate ability. And that's what we need to focus on capturing in the future. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I'd like to leave you with a little bit of uh, Northern Arizona trivia. Some of you may or may not know that the San Francisco Peaks here in Flagstaff have the highest mountain in Arizona. It is Humphreys Peak at 12,633 feet. Uh, it's a stratovolcano, and it 
comprises six peaks around the volcanic field, which also en encompasses Sunset Crater. But for those of you that didn't realize, the San Francisco peaks used to be a San Francisco mountain. It blew its top 200,000 years ago. And prior to that, it was 16,000 feet high, as estimated. That would make it the highest mountain in the continental United States at that time. So pretty impressive. Why do we do this? Always wear a helmet. Thank you. There, there certainly are uh, alternative modalities. And certainly when we talk about conservative measures, we talk about physical therapy. Uh, there is injection therapy. We briefly touched on the possibility of utilizing either platelet-rich plasma or a bone marrow aspirate stem cell injection. I think the bigger question is why would you want to have a rotator cuff tear not treated appropriately? Certainly there are individuals that for various reasons, whether it be their health, uh, their age, uh, their social situation, that just are not good surgical candidates. And in those individuals, I think injection therapy is very promising, as well as physical therapy, where you can actually strengthen the existing musculature and try to keep that shoulder functioning as best as it can. So impingement of the rotator cuff, again, briefly, is a pinching of the bursa that lies between the tendons and the bone above. So you have the bone below, known as the humeral head, the tendons that attach to that, and then above the roof, uh, which is a bony structure called the acromion. Between that is the bursa. That can create a bursitis when it is pinched and uh, when too much stress or chronic overuse is uh, done. What do I suggest for that? Well, again, it depends on duration. And I think initially you start with a conservative approach. Sometimes it can be as simple as correct uh, rotator cuff strengthening exercises. Sometimes it can be as simple as postural adjustment. I can't tell you how many people you see walking around or sitting with their cell phones and their shoulders are protracted forward and it's just a scenario for impingement to occur. So by proper postural adjustment, proper physical therapy, you can at times cure impingement. Certainly injection therapy is another conservative measure that is helpful. Not always indicated at first, but can sometimes be utilized. So the AC joint, which is the acromioclavicular joint, uh, when we talk about AC sprains or AC separations, we're talking about tearing of the structures that maintain the stability of that joint. So instability of that joint occurs because of tearing of some of those structures. Primarily there are three major ones and we have a grading system that, deter that basically determines when one tears you have a scenario, when you have two, when you have three. So depending on the amount of instability you have is based on how many structures have been torn and how, what is the effect. The body again tries to heal those structures. The problem is is when the joint is separated the healing that occurs is elongated and so now you have a joint that is chronically unstable and has an abnormal appearance. So frozen shoulder uh, one of those entities that frustrate many people and it usually occurs uh, for no apparent reason. There, it's more common in women, it's more common in those that have a underactive thyroid, it's also more common, far more common in patients that have lack of sugar control or diabetes. And the answer is no, surgery is not always necessary for that. The best response to frozen shoulder is when you start noticing pain and an inability to move the shoulder in certain motions, you need to be seen by a provider because the quicker we get to it with conservative measures, 
the faster and the better we are at treating it. What are those conservative measures? Well, physical therapy. Uh, additionally, steroid pack, steroid injection. Uh, the pathology is that there's a contraction of the tissue that's ongoing inside the shoulder joint itself. And you, what we're trying to do is maintain motion. Probably one of the biggest problems is that patients will go and exercise or try and do strengthening, and that's counterproductive to frozen shoulder. If frozen shoulder gets a hold on you, then the process can be long. It can be three months of what we call the freezing phase, and then three months of the frozen phase, and then three months of a thawing phase. Frequently these days we don't let patients just fester through all those phases. If we catch things late, then surgical intervention is one consideration in which we go and free up tissues in the shoulder and then start uh, immediate range of motion. And there's actually some new research out there about doing blocks in physical therapy, in the physical therapy department, where then they can actually manipulate shoulders uh, into certain motions that are just not tolerated uh, without a block. Well, I'm not privy to Tenix itself, but I will tell you that ultrasound therapy certainly is a nice modality uh, for heating of soft tissues the depth uh, of how deep ultrasound uh, can actually penetrate is one issue when we're talking about deeper structures within the shoulder joint uh, and also soft tissue mass uh, so body habitus of the person themselves so I just saw a couple of these today and it's an interesting phenomena because not only is there torn biceps tendons from the shoulder, but there's also torn biceps tendons from the elbow, of course. That's a different discussion. Now, from the shoulder, it's interesting because there are different cultures, uh, primarily in Europe, that believe that the biceps isn't actually that necessary and can simply be released or torn at will and that that will be tolerated. I think here in the U.S. we're a little bit more we're a little bit more aware that a lack of a biceps can lead to spasming, it can lead to some weakness, uh, it can lead to essentially decreases in um, efficiency of such as supination pronation activity, that's like when you use a screwdriver, that type of motion. Uh, the endurance can be lost with a biceps tear. So what is the treatment? Well, the important thing is to realize that the biceps and all structures in the body are really dependent on the stress that they see. So once you have a biceps tear, that tendinous structure instantly is relieved of its stress. And the body has a miraculous way of going around and saying, I like you tissue, I need you for something else. And it will start to degrade that very quickly. Now that doesn't mean within seconds or minutes, but what it does mean is that your ability to reconnect the biceps is really within the first four to six weeks. When you start getting beyond that, the tendon has lost its integrity, it's lost its structure, and the ability for it to be a successful surgery is really not there anymore. 